Hey, James, do you feel something right now? I think I do, Alex. What do you got going on? It's college football back here in SoCal. Here, USC and UCLA playing this weekend here in the next episode of Sideline Sports Podcast. Welcome to Sideline Sports Podcast. If you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. And we welcome you all to another edition of Sideline Sports Podcast. I'm the host, Alex Nebeka, where if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. The source of your SoCal sports news. And with me today is a very old colleague of mine, but still has a spot dear to my heart here after going to Long Beach State together. If you guys remember the face, he came on in very early stages of Sideline Sports Podcast, Mr. James Williams himself. James, how are you doing today? And you know what? Uh, what have you been up to lately? What have I been up to? What has the city of L.A. been up to? Um, you know, covering sports and, and uh, being in, in the, the sports section at the Southern California News Group, the Orange County Register, and the L.A. Daily News. Uh, covering the Lakers, covering the Dodgers, covering a pair of championship teams. So it's been nice to kind of watch from afar, obviously, uh, with the teams in the bubble. Everyone's in a bubble, more or less, uh, during these crazy pandemic quarantine times. But uh, I can't complain. I'm healthy. Family's healthy. Everyone's doing well. You're looking great as well. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been good. I can't complain too much. And um, for as crazy of a year as 2020 has been, with the virus, with the death of Kobe Bryant. Um, it's been, it's been kind of nice to see the end of the year coming out a little bit better than it started uh, with the pair of championships for teams that when you look at the Lakers, haven't won one in 10 years. You look at the Dodgers, before years. I was born, that's like 30 something years. So, so it's, it's a good time for SoCal sports. That's for sure. Especially uh, with, with the new, um, stadium that just happened to pop up in in Inglewood as well for the Rams and the Chargers so a lot going on and we'll see with what USC and UCLA will do they're kind of late to the party I guess you can say obviously with everything going on in the Pac-12 and that whole the virus situation you had all these other teams all these other leagues with basketball MLB uh, then you had NFL starting up and now we're just barely getting um college football in california i mean we've had college football going on in the south and everything with alabama lsu clemson and all those teams going but you know what they say about la we're always late to the party for everything so here we are better late than ever as i like to say but you know what james can they be fashionably late meaning can these teams really walk the walk And I mean, you're pretty familiar with UCLA. You have the privilege of covering UCLA football and seeing what practices are looking like and seeing the prep for this very short in season. For those of you guys that don't know, there is no non-conference schedule. It's going to be strictly a six-game season. So best of six, why not? Let's duke it out, go straight to the interesting meet and Mm -hmm. the interesting part of the season. So James, I wanted to ask you, what have been the protocols for the players as far as uh, coming into practices and such? So it's, it's kind of weird. So I covered them. I covered UCLA football last year um, and UCLA basketball last year for a little bit of the season. And both of those teams, um, you know, we were able to go to the practices. We were able to be on campus and watch uh, parts, not all of practice, but, but, but a good part of it. And um, that hasn't been the case this year, actually, for media um we don't get to go to the practices so we really don't Mm. we know enough we do get opportunities to talk to the players through zoom much like we're doing but um yeah it's it's kind of a weird situation because it's almost like you would have more to write about you would have an injury report you know teams uh at the college level at least for ucla they're they don't have to really give out a injury report we were always 
So one of the things that we would do when we were at practice was being able to look and seeing who's on the sideline with the trainer, who's coming out of, of that weekend's game on Monday and who's on the sideline. Is that injury still lingering after that game a few days prior? Um, we would be able to spot these things and, and we had to look for ourselves. They weren't, you know, as you would expect, if you're a team and you're, you have another game coming up, you're not going to be very forward unless you have to be about an injury. Um, so it was up to us to ask uh, Coach Chip Kelly to ask maybe some of the other players on, on the status of somebody or just kind of look for the, for the time we had available to see during practice where someone was. Um, we don't have that luxury, I guess you could say, this year. All we have to go off of right now is the things that we hear and we're, we're able to ask about. I mean, we could ask anything, really, but whatever, whatever information we're able to get from the Zoom interviews and who they give us that day to talk to is really what we have to work with. Uh, you get Chip Kelly maybe twice a week. Uh, right now, we're kind of getting a little bit of everybody. We'll, we'll see how that, that interview schedule works out once we get into the season. But, um, you know, we're seeing familiar faces pop up. Everyone still has a smile on their face. So I don't think there's any serious injuries for UCLA right now. But it has, it's just been a different experience altogether, especially for those guys as well, the football players, obviously. Um, once the quarantine, once the pandemic kind of came in with those first few early months, the players left campus and they returned home. Um, so a lot of their studying, a lot of their off season, a lot of their, what would, would have been their spring ball session was whatever they made of it while they were at home, um, which is good for some who may live locally or they, they're coming from um, LA County, Riverside County schools. Um, but then we have some of these guys, especially like your starting quarterback, Dorian Thompson Robinson, who w went back to Nevada, but then was also trying to make the most of it and was going to uh, Texas to go and meet with his quarterback coach. Um, trying to get in shape, trying to stay in shape, trying to uh, learn playbooks, new plays, and communicate through Zoom um, to go over film. It was very interesting for them, you know, just to, they had a, it was whatever they made of it. There were probably some NCAA roles where they probably didn't have a lot of interaction with the coaches, I don't think. Um, but it was more of what, you know, the teammates holding each other accountable, you know. Um, after some time, they were kind of able to move back onto campus. They're all in one dorm room, not not in one dorm room, but in one building, one building. of dorms, more or less, and, and what they call the ecosystem over at UCLA on their campus. Um, the whole building is nothing but football players. I don't think there's even any other athletes, at least in that building. I may be wrong about that. But um, they get tested every day. And, um, you know, for the most part, they, I mean, they've been good. They haven't had, and not only for the football team, but for all sports at UCLA, they've came out pretty clean. They did have a, um, a false positive uh, a week or two ago that ended up not, you know, not being a true positive. So it was a false positive, something, you know, whatever, even, even with medical situation stuff, not everything's perfect. So um, that got addressed. Uh, he may have been quarantined for a day or two. The athlete was, they weren't really forward with the name. I think there was an idea of who, who the player was, but again, not worth mentioning just because it was a false positive. Um, so, so they, I mean, they, for, from a health standpoint with injuries, with COVID and everything, they've been um, pretty healthy. And that's all you can ask for, especially when you look at some of these other teams in the league or, or in college football. Um, I think it was the university of Houston it's been a few weeks now, but I know that within their first three or four games, they got canceled and they had a big outbreak, multiple players out. You look at someone as prominent as uh, Clemson's Trevor Lawrence, uh, someone who was uh, tested positive for COVID, missed this last game, is expected to miss this weekend's game. Um, so, you know, so it, it's going to affect, I mean, it's going to affect people. We and and we thought the back twelve was going to start off. You know, the thing is too. We talking to the UCLA players and and Coach Chip Kelly. I don't know why I keep saying Coach Chip Kelly, but Chip Kelly. He um, they're very optimistic. Everything's looked good for them. Um, everything's looked good for the Pac twelve for the most part. Um, and so now that we're two or three days away from game time, or from game day, you're seeing uh, Cal and 
Washington have their game canceled as at the request of Cal because they had one or two uh, positive cases today. And so the conference did come out with a little statement about that. And that game looks like it's going to be canceled. So we're already in the first game, uh, first week of games for the Pac-12, uh, starting, I think, with one on Friday. But we're already going to have one game canceled. And hopefully, but possibly, uh, a trend of what may be to come. So again, you mentioned earlier the with the, the Pac-12 schedule, they're not the teams are not playing against other non-conference opponents like they normally would. Um, it's strictly based on their either South or North division, whatever division they're kind of based out of, with only one crossover team from each. So for example, um, UCLA got the short drew the short stick, and not only do they have a division that features um, some tough teams like Arizona State and um, USC, obviously. But they're also going to run into Oregon, who's from the North, but is that one crossover team. Uh, Oregon went on to win the Rose Bowl last year and, and the Pac-12 title. So, you know, that's not a good – and Utah's in the South as well. So it's going to be a tough schedule. So when one way to look at the Oregon um, game on the schedule is it does strengthen the schedule. But it is a tough opponent for them, one they may not win. Um, so, and again, too, with the season being so short with just the conference games, you're going to – every game is going to count. All, you know, if you ask any player, Absolutely. they're going to say every game counts anyways. But if you lose one or two games, and maybe this applies more so to even a U USC than a UCLA, um, obviously with, with Keaton Slovis at quarterback returning for USC um, – they're expected to probably win or at least compete with Oregon for that Pac-12 title. And that might even be the Pac-12 title game. Um, but when you look at those teams and you look at a USC, you, you know, a USC was ranked 21, I think at one point, I'm not they sure were. where they're at now, they but were. they were ranked 21 two weeks, three weeks before the, their season's even going to start this week. Um, so they were in the top 25 and are regarded as one of the top 25 teams in college football. But when you look at it, if they lose one or two games, they're going to be out of the top 25. They're not going to be a, a, a playoff contender. You know, um, you lose one or two games, especially to a team that you shouldn't lose to. Um, we talked about it a little bit earlier um, off off before we started the um, the show. Arizona State is, is coming to USC to start the season. Arizona State may – be an okay team to lose to maybe i mean you don't want to lose but let's say they 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 mess around and, and they fumble against arizona and lose that game a team in the pac-12 south who's expected to finish last in that division um they lose that game they're out and then then at that point your dream goes from uh playing in one of the top five bowl games to or even the national championship to just playing for the Pac-12 title. And, you know, everyone loves the Pac-12 title, I'm sure, but you want to compete for a national championship, um, especially when you start off the season ranked. And one or two games could, could be costly for them. Um, back to UCLA, they're pretty optimistic about where they are. They did lose a lot of linebackers, um, a lot of them that were based out of SoCal. One of them that wasn't is Chris Barnes. He's now with the Green Bay Packers. He went undrafted, um, had a chance to talk to him and follow his journey a little bit. Um, leading up to the draft and uh, covering him last season. He's obviously doing great things now. He's started a few games, especially, again, as an undrafted free agent, um, or starting, you know, coming in as an undrafted free agent for them, making the team, and is a starter now. Um, you know, that kind of shows what is going to be lacking on the linebackers, at the linebacker position for UCLA. But um, they do return some guys, and, you know, they do have a whole lot of receivers returning. They're, they're, they're stacked at receiver. So that is one of the positives. So there's a lot of good and bad with UCLA. Are they in the mix for a Pac-12 title this year? Probably not. They, they'll tell you, that, you know, all the things that you would want – they would want fans to hear. But realistically, no, they'll probably go about 500, I think. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Well, James, you bring up a lot of valuable points right now. With the, that's the huge, that's the biggest con 
with having a shortened season with only six games, it only takes losing a game or two to really knock you out of contention and even trying to take the top of your respective conference there. And, you know, being a team like UCLA, you know, you've been out of it for, you know, a couple of years already and trying to keep up with a program like USC, your crosstown rival, it's uh, going to be tough, going to be really interesting. But you were already talking about the junior quarterback in Dorian Thompson Robinson himself. Have you been able to see a little bit of what his or even hear about what his workout regimen has looked like? So he's um, so one of the things that was interesting, and I kind of wrote about it last week. Um, is he claims that he has not thrown an interception or turned the ball over uh, during this during the, the the fall camp that they had leading into this season. So over the last four weeks, he says he has not thrown an interception or had a turnover or or for or wow. given up the ball as a fumble or anything. Whether that's true, we don't know. Again, we're not at practice to find out. But if it is, that's great, especially for UCLA fans. Uh, one of the things with uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson being a um, a dual threat quarterback, being able to pass the ball but being able to run the ball, is you're going to have your fair share of turnovers. I think he threw 12 interceptions off the top of my head, and he may have had at least two or three fumbles. So turnovers were a factor for Dorian Thompson Robinson and something he has to fix, something he's – says he's addressed obviously if he's not throwing any interceptions during practice but he said if he were to throw an interception he would follow um uh, um what president was sent by uh, the running back uh group and they're actually if they fumble the ball during practice they do some sort of extra conditioning drills they're rolled around on the field as some sort of um punishment as he called it which you know is, is normal and good so you know they some extra motivation to prevent turnovers for sure. Um, so, I mean, again, you're, we're going at the word of whatever they're saying, but again, if you're that, that bold as to, as to actually, I mean, if it's true, I'm not saying it's not, but if he says he didn't throw an interception, I mean, I'll take him at his word. Um, so that would be a good thing for Bruin fans going into this. And obviously for the team, if, if the turnovers are limited for Dorian Thompson Robinson, again, like I said, um, it's whatever they made of it while they were back at home before they returned to campus. Uh, he was working out with his quarterback coach. He also has a brother who is an MMA fighter and, and has done wow. some boxing. Apparently cool. he says, um, I don't think, I don't think he's um, some top ranked MMA guy, but he has been in the octagon before um, from what I've seen and, and kind of read about, but um, you know, so he's using some of that um, kind of adding to his skill set. I guess you can say, I guess you can say, or at least getting that sort of conditioning in, uh, working with his brother, doing some boxing drills and some different MMA stuff, I guess. Nothing too crazy. I mean, he said boxing. He didn't say MMA, which at least I'm sure uh, the, the UCLA coaching staff was glad to hear because the last thing you need is your starting quarterback who's been uh, the main guy going into his third year now uh, doing MMA and, and getting roughed up or, you know, whatever the case is. So. Right. He says he's been boxing and, and that's good conditioning. Um, so we'll see. I mean, to, so to answer your question, what has the workouts look like? We don't really know. We're just going at their word. He does look good. He's coming in, you know, he, he, he may look a little bigger than he has in the past. Um, you know, he's also been kind of vocal too, you know, obviously excited about the season, but with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, with social justice issues and different things. He's kind of been a leader or at the forefront, whether he, even if he didn't want to be, um, he would have been as a starting quarterback, obviously in being black or African-American, um, you know, he's kind of been the vocal leader in that regard too. So he's had that on his plate as well as, as many other football players across the country and within the team at UCLA as well, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so he's had a lot on his plate. Um, with the pandemic, with social justice issues, with preparing to be the starting quarterback again for um, UCLA. So we'll see. Um, he does, again, the, the receivers he has returning, the, the, the it's kind of give and take with the offense. So he, he's going to have weapons for sure on offense with the receivers. He did lose a tight end. Uh, Devin Asiasi, who went to the NFL draft. He left early from UCLA as a junior. He was drafted late. Yeah, he was drafted in a later round by the New England Patriots. Um, 
and is on the roster. So he, you know, they're losing an NFL caliber guy and are looking to replace it with the guys that they have available. They did have a, a Jordan Wilson who had also been with the program and would have been um, a valuable guy for Dorian Thompson Robinson, someone that he's kind of had some chemistry with um, just looking at the stats of Jordan Wilson, but he transferred out, I believe to Florida state. So the tight end position is something that needs work, but they have more than enough receivers to kind of uh, pass the ball around. They do lose Joshua Kelly, another NFL uh, talent that got drafted to the Los Angeles Chargers. He didn't have to go very far or change his outfit colors because he's still wearing that blue and yellow, that blue and gold. Um, so Joshua Kelly, a thousand yard rusher, two seasons in a row. Um, they do lose his production. They do have Demetric Felton who will kind of lead that, um, that running back room um, and the backfield. But the offensive line uh, remains questionable again this year. Um, they did lose a senior in boss, Tago, Tago Bailoa. I, I'm, I'm butchering the last name right now. Um, obviously, he's not with the program right now, so not familiar with the last name like I normally would have been last season. Um, but losing, your, losing him on the line is big. Um, was obviously pursuing the NFL. I don't think he's landed with a team yet. Um, and they did have two starters that did transfer out. Um, one went to Oklahoma um, with fe with fellow receiver or fe former teammate at UCLA, now teammate at Oklahoma, and Theo Howard, uh, who transferred in the middle of last season. But um, you lose him. You lose uh, Jake Burton to Baylor, which doesn't help the offensive line. They already The only two guys that were returning to the offensive line with experience are two guys who were true freshmen last year and got some valuable experience from it. But again, when you're only two guys returning are guys who were true freshmen last year coming in as sophomores this year, it does do well going ahead in the future, assuming those guys will stay. They're going to stay at least next year and maybe another year after that. So your line could look better in a few years, but right now it is still a big question mark for the UCLA offense. Um, they have some holes to fill. They do have some some guys um, that have been with the program that will likely fill in those voids. We'll see how it goes, but it could be another long season for Dorian Thompson Robinson, especially when health is important for him to stay on the field. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on at UCLA because I'm just talking, but there's just so much going on that when you start thinking about it, um, the offensive line needs needs to, needs to get it together. I'm not saying that. I mean, they know that. They're aware of it. But they need to keep Dorian Thompson Robinson healthy. He hasn't played at least, I think, the last two seasons. He's always he's missed the game. I know last year he didn't start a game because he was out, and he got injured during one or two games that knocked him out of the game. So they need him healthy in order to provide the best chance to win. They did lean on their backup, which does bring forward the question of who their backup will be. Um, they have two guys with the first name of Chase who are chasing that starting uh, or that backup role for you for UCLA. Um, their backup from last year who filled in when when Dorian was out, um, Austin Burton transferred out blank or he went to Purdue. He transferred he transferred to Purdue. Um, so again, another hole to fill more or less. What happens? What happens if Dorian goes down? Who that quarterback will be to step in? Um, but they did, you know, they did get a four-star recruit. I don't think he's in this QB competition for the backup role, but they do have a four a four-star recruit sitting there um, as likely their third or fourth option. So they're comfortable or, or they're okay with whoever is the backup. Um, but yeah, that offensive line is going to be huge, and on whatever they come to do or figure out, they need to keep them healthy because if they find themselves down with an offensive line that isn't as strong as it could have been. And then you have your backup quarterback in at some point. Things can get ugly on offense real quick. Um, no matter who you have at receivers, it doesn't matter if you're not getting the ball out, out of the quarterback's hands. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. It, it just depends. I mean, that that's the beauty of the season, though, uh, or the start of the season is we don't know, and we just have to sit back and find out like everybody else. That's the exciting thing about college football. You just don't know what you're going to get. It's always like a little surprise what you're going to get mm -hmm. out of the season. Looks like UCLA is going to look pretty solid offensively as they did last season. They, scoring points wasn't an issue for them, mm -hmm. but you got to look at the other side of the ball and playing defense. They did allow a lot of points. So, James, when you did talk to Coach uh, Chip Kelly, 
did he – what did he say about defense? Because, I mean, there has to be something that has to be mentioned for UCLA because they did allow a lot of points last season. Yeah, so the defense, the defense is, is, is kind of interesting. So they have some guys. They, they do return some pieces, especially some from last year who were injured or had academic issues that are coming back to fill in some important roles for them. Um, for example, Quentin Lake coming in at defensive back, filling in for uh, filling that void that Darnay Holmes left, who was who was drafted this April to the New York Giants. Um, so you have Quentin Lake coming back. He had a wrist hand injury last year that kept him out of action a lot of last year. You also have um, Bo Calvert coming back. He's a local guy. I believe he played at uh, Thousand Oaks High. Not Thousand Oaks. I think Thousand Oaks. I'm blinking on the high school, but he's a local guy. Didn't play last year because of academic suspension. Only played in the last game last year, but did pretty well. So that was a that's a bright spot or some something to have some optim awesome blah, 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 some to be optimistic about. Um, if 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 you if they get as jumbled as I am, they can be in trouble in trouble. That's for sure. Um, it, it's just it's. As you could tell, when I started thinking about the defense, kind of my mind goes all over the place because it could go one or two ways. They have some veteran guys that can make this defense really good, and they're really thinking they can take the next step, especially for a lot of these guys who are in their third year with the program. Chip Kelly's in his third year with the program. This is a big year for Chip Kelly as well. Um, obviously, Chip Kelly's not going to say this or admit this, um, and maybe he doesn't believe this, but I'm gonna. I'm saying it. <laughs> this is a big year for Chip Kelly because this is now. Um, when when you look at new coaches who come in, it takes them a while to kind of get their guys to get their system in. Now we're in a point with UCLA and Coach Chip Kelly's um, tenure with the program or his stint with the program or whatever you want to call it. Um, where he's in his third year, so the guys that he has recruited, the guys that he has brought in are the guys who are now leading, playing on this team. Um, I think they have a true freshman, Damian Sellers, who's coming in this year, who's going to start um, again. That's going to be a Chip Kelly recruit. So the guys this year, like you're judging things on what Chip Kelly and his staff did. Um, so, of course, he's going to be optimistic, and he's going to, you know, he, he's happy with what he's seen so far. Um, there was There was some – debate on whether or not the defensive coordinator was going to get let go during the off season. Um, Jerry Azario, I think I'm saying that right. Azario, I'm blinking on names. This is why we can't be doing zoom interviews um, for media. Cover. Like we need to be out on the field and talking to these guys and like getting the names <laughs> and, and talking to it. it like, yeah. it's just like, it's just, it's, as you can see, it's like tough to remember names and, and learn new names and put faces to names and, and just, it's just, it's different. Um, you know, even when, even just seeing the other media members and, and comparing no comparing notes or what they saw, like, Hey, did you see someone out there? I didn't see him or whatever. Like just saying these names and just, you know, um, so you just, you know, it, it's just, it's a big mess for everyone. Everyone's doing the best that they can to get through with this. But again, just going back to Chip Kelly, third year with the program, there, there was some talk of whether or not the defensive coordinator was going to get let go. He actually comes back this year, but they did add some new coaches to the staff. Um, uh, Nansen is one who's coming from USC, which is interesting. He comes in from USC, a very experienced guy. He's coached multiple positions. He also was an assistant coach for um, Clay Helton last year, I believe, um, but was let go when USC needed to make some coaching changes. Um, so he just comes on down the street and comes on over to UCLA. A lot of people say he's bringing the juice and he's bringing the energy and he's kind of, you know, he's kind of adding a spark to, to whatever they need on defense. Um, something that every, every defensive player who's come up and has asked about coach Nansen, they say he's bringing the juice. So whatever the juice is, it's getting them going. It's, you know, it's, it's getting the, it's getting them going. They're fired up. Another guy was coach Norwood who's coming from Navy, I believe, or has experience coaching at Navy. He was actually a guy that was in, in, um, in a spot where he could have landed a head coaching job somewhere or was at least finalist or whatever for, for some head coaching jobs. Comes to UCLA, um, is coaching the DBs. I believe he's also like the passing game coordinator. Um, so they didn't let go of the defensive coordinator, you know, but Chip Kelly did bring in some guys uh, to help coach the defense. So we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's just – we don't know. 
it's just, it's just the, the, I would say this. So the biggest thing, and Coach uh, Chip Kelly has talked about this, the players have talked about this, is the, the leadership that has been lost on, at linebacker. It's not like they lost one or two guys. They lost one or two captains. They literally lost like four guys who were captains, who were multiple year starters, um, experienced guys. And when you look at linebacker, that's kind of like your quarterback of the defense. And if you're not losing, if you lose one guy, you kind of get away with it, but you're losing four guys. One of them is in the NFL, three others who were solid playmakers for you guys. Um, and I think to help combat that and, and kind of make up for that, they've kind of changed. They aren't saying they changed the whole defense. I don't know how much of that's just so they don't tip their hand to Colorado and some of these other Pac-12 teams, but they have kind of talked about this new four, two, five defense that they're doing. Um, which will have four guys up front. You're going to have two linebackers instead of three or four like they did last year. And that leaves you with five defensive backs. Um, one of those defensive backs can also be like a linebacker or whatever the case is. So they're trying different stuff. They're doing different things this year. They have different people, different faces, a lot of guys with experience, but maybe weren't starters last year. Um, I don't know. If, if I had to put a bigger question mark on the offense or the defense, Right now, the defense might be the question mark right now. Uh, I think the defense is going to be what makes this either a good or a bad season for UCLA. Well, we're just going to have to keep an eye out on the defense for UCLA because I'm mm -hmm. a firm believer that defense will win you ball games. And speaking of winning ball games, James, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Uh -oh. You had to quickly guess well, how UCLA will finish this very short season and where in the Pac-12 South they will finish. What's your prediction? So I actually had – I did a piece on this, so I'm glad I, I'm glad I did my homework for this. I think I had, <laughs> them, I had them down six games. So there's six, six games scheduled right now. And, again, this is all assuming that there's COVID-free on both ends and everyone's healthy and all the games are played. I don't have the article I wrote in front of me. I want to find my notes. Let's look at my notebook. Let's see what I had down. Um, excuse me if I'm making noise. Here it is right here. So I have, I'll go game by game. We're going to go with this first game at Colorado. Is, is, is kind of like a good test for Colorado and for UCLA in the Pac-12 South to get the season started. I think both teams are kind of even. Uh, UCLA, or actually Colorado, has a new coach coming in who was actually a coach many moons ago um, at UCLA. He was the head coach there. Now, uh, Ken Dornell, I believe is the name. He is now coaching Colorado his first year. He was in the NFL. He's now coming back to the college game for the first time in, in a little while. So Colorado's kind of a question mark, but I do have that down as a win for UCLA to start the season. There's also a new quarterback for Colorado. So if this defense, which I have down as a question mark right now, needs some confidence and needs to get things figured out with this new defense they're doing, get the coaches going, get some confidence on some of these younger guys who haven't started games, this will be a good game and a good test for them, uh, especially when they are without the elite receiver they had last year too at Colorado. Um, I think this will be a good confidence boost if they do come out on top against Colorado at Colorado this Saturday. Um, so I do have that as a win. So for keeping track at home, I have UCLA at one and O. Oh. Um, things get ugly quick, <laughs> very quick. They start the second week of the schedule again at home, which I still don't think helps them out very much, but they will be hosting Utah, a team who won the Pac-12 South last year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They won the Pac-12 South last year, played in that Pac-12 championship game against Oregon. Oregon did get the better of Utah in that game. But um, Utah is returning some guys. They are without their running back. They are without their quarterback. So, again, if the defense can can use that confidence, I have them getting after, the, after their first game, applying some of that against um, Utah. Maybe they get a win, but I have it down as a loss this year, especially uh, – Utah just resigned or gave an extension to their to their coach Kyle Whittingham. He just got a new extension, new deal for him. Um, they're not going anywhere, and I don't think the Bruins are going anywhere in order to defeat Utah this year. Um, so I have them at one and one to start the season. Things again, they continue to get ugly as the third week is on the road for UCLA against Oregon. 
Oregon doesn't have Justin Herbert this year. Justin Herbert uh, joins Joshua Kelly with the Chargers this year. Uh, obviously, Herbert's looking pretty good. So who will replace um, Herbert at Oregon? There was a name thrown out, but we can't, we, you know, we're not expecting him to be Justin Herbert. That's for sure. Um, again, surprise, the defense has an opportunity to use whatever confidence or what, you know, whatever they need, whatever juice that they talk about, whatever they need to get past it. Like if, if they can get past these two games, weeks two and three, they'll be feeling pretty good about themselves. They would probably go ahead and lose another a game to, uh, to a team they shouldn't lose to the next week after. But, I mean, if you can get past an Oregon and a Utah, you'll know a lot about what this team's going to be going for for the rest of this season. Um, I do have them at one and two to start the season with a loss to Utah and Oregon. Um, then you go to Arizona. Uh, they kind of run this stretch of Arizona teams here with Arizona in week Three, four. Yeah, week four is Arizona. Week five is Arizona State. Um, Arizona, again, I mentioned, is supposed to be the team that finishes at the bottom of this Pac-12 South division. I have UCLA getting a win, even though they lost last year to um, Arizona, a game they shouldn't have lost. It was like a, uh, I think it was like 14 to 13, maybe. Um, it, was, it was a game they shouldn't have lost. But anyways, I have winning. I have them at two and two to start the season which is actually kind of better than I thought they would be. Um, re and remember, this is the team last year, UCLA, that went one in five to start the season. Um, they could have just ended the season. You know, the players could have just quit. Morale could have been broken up or whatever. They go on and they win three straight games and, uh, you know, kind of salvage some of that season. It didn't end pretty for them either. But there was that good middle part of the section that everyone's going to love that from last season. Um, so again, I wouldn't count this team out. I think there might be a surprise in here. I'm not, I don't think I have this all right, but again, this is the fun thing with predictions. I have a win over Arizona. Then I have them losing the following week in week five against ASU and Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels is someone I covered in high school. He's their starting quarterback. Started as a true freshman, broke some records, did some good things for the Sun Devils last year. I expect him to have a little more size on this year, a little more confidence and experience, obviously. Um, I, uh, UCLA did win this one. Again, they lose to a team in Arizona. They shouldn't have lost you last year. Then they come back the next week, or I don't know if it was the next week, but then they come back to Arizona and they beat Arizona State. So, you know, it's just one of those things where, where you, you they're, they're playing at the level of the team they're competing with. So if they're competing, you know, they're competing at a high level and they get a win over in Arizona State, they mess around and play at the level of, um, of Arizona, who was still trying to figure out their quarterback situation, and they lose the game. Um, it, you know, so I have them down. Wait, do I have them at a winning record? I have a, a win at Colorado, a loss at Utah. No, well, a loss at – no, a win at Colorado, a loss at home against Utah, a loss at Oregon, a win at Arizona, two and two. Wow. I, I have think it might be three and three. Wow. <laughs> Hold on now. Hold on now. I'm trying to um, – wow. Okay, wait. So they have one win and a loss, another loss, a win and a win. So they're going to be three and two. According to what I have here, I have them at three and two to, to go – going into the final – Wait a minute. You're missing one. No, I'm I'm getting there. I'm oh, getting there. okay, okay. I got him at three this and two. It's a very important game for us. I, I got him going in at three and two the final week of the season against USC. There we go. USC is probably going to be a team who's going to win the Pac-12. You asked me earlier where I think the Bruins will fall in the Pac-12 South. Obviously, I guess a little better than I thought looking back at how I predicted this. But I do have them losing to, U to USC, something that UCLA fans probably don't want to hear. But – USC and Keaton Slovis, they tore them up. They tore up that defense last year. Uh, the score made it look a little, little better than it was, but no, Keaton Slovis, as a, um, I don't know if he was a true freshman, but he wasn't expected to be the starter last season. Takes over for JT Daniels, who got injured. 
and uh, carved up that UCLA defense in, in the second to last game of the season. I expect that to happen again this year. Um, will it be close? Maybe. You know how rivalry games go, but I think USC will come out on top um, and kind of um, secure their spot in the Pac-12 uh, title game. I Yeah, um, I guess I have. So that leaves USC at, or UCLA at three and three. Which sounds about right. It, I, it, I kind of have them as a 500 team. That sounds about right. I have them. It's just when you think about them starting off one and five last year, and to have them as a three and two team or or, or anything like that, it's kind of surprising. Um, that that U, that UCLA game will be important. So the the thing too with this is that there's supposed to be a seventh game on the schedule. Um, that's my understanding. The way it works out is, yeah, so so whoever the best two teams, the, the team from the Pac-12 North, the team from the Pac-12 South, those winners will meet each other in the Pac-12 Conference Championship game. Those other teams will all play a game based on where they finish in their division. So I'm making this up here. Let's say UCLA's fourth. They finish fourth in the Pac-12 South. They'll play the uh, fourth place team from the north. Um, I believe it does get a little confusing if if it's a team you already played. Again, um, UCLA is going to play Oregon, who's in the north this year on the schedule already. Um, if for whatever reason Oregon finished fourth in the north, which is not going to happen, um, I think they they would avoid like rematches. Like if if they already played a team their team from the north already, I think they'll work around it. But You'll see um, UC, uh, UCLA will be able to play a team that finished on the, uh, in the opposing conference or however you want to say it, and um, maybe play a team at their level, maybe have a game that they can win to finish the season. And if anything, if they do get that win, maybe they'll be four and three. Wow. And give them a winning right. record. I guess right. that's a winning record. And put them at above 500. So I guess that's a winning record. And then from the oh, it gets better. I am, I'm, 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 I haven't looked this far ahead in the season, and I'm just trying to remember from how the schedules played out. And again, everything we're talking about right now can totally change the minute an outbreak happens for mm-hmm. any of these. An outbreak can cancel one game, two game. I mean, what we pay close attention on what happens with Cal and Washington, um, with that game being canceled this week, like we talked about earlier. Whatever happens there will kind of maybe give us an idea of what the Pac-12 will do. I don't know if they're going to make up that game again or what. But, um, but yeah, so it, it, I think if Oregon, if UCLA finishes four and three with that seventh game, I think they make a bowl game. It wouldn't be a great bowl game. Um, I think only two of like 36 bowl games have been canceled. So most of the bowl games are supposed to happen. Um, maybe they play in the Chips Ahoy Bowl. I don't know what bowl they have. They have all these bowls. But I think, you know, if they have a winning record, I think – I don't think they're trying to get every – It you know, it's it's a weird rule with that too because of the COVID thing and, and teams have played 10 games or however many games. You know, you have teams that have already played five games and you, Pac-12 is barely going to start. Um so they're going to have to really evaluate how this is going to shake out at the end of the season. But I think we could see a bowl game if things go according to how I have it here and they go four and three. We'll see. I might have to write an article about this. I I kind of blew my own, my own mind with some of it. Like I got jumbled earlier. Like I'm, I'm like literally all over the place right now just because I kind of maybe I would just, th- when you just hear UCLA, you think about their situation Who's returning? Who's not returning? What can happen? All these different scenarios. I may have only had them as a two-win team, but looking at the paper, really looking at the schedule with some time. Yeah, I guess they can go four and three. Apparently. Hey, anything could happen. I mean, with that extra game, they could be above five hundred. That would be a huge improvement for UCLA. There. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see when they last had a winning when they had a winning record because i think since chip kelly's there obviously rebuilding and whatnot i think they've had losing records i'll post it on twitter i have to look into that when the last time they had a winning record was 
it might not have been that far. It might not have been that long ago, but hey, they were, you know, that I was saying la about last season, they had a three game winning streak there in the middle of their up and down season, but up to the end with like two or three games left to play and how things may have worked out in some other games, there was still a slim chance that this UCLA team from last year, and again, a lot of these guys are returning back this year, could have been in the Pac-12 title game. It wasn't like, it was kind of a crazy scenario, but it was being discussed. Like it was a chance. Things had to like work out and they needed luck and they needed to win games. They didn't win any of those games, but there was still talk of like the possibility so I'm shocked that they're going to potentially be four and three. I would be even. Well, I mean, I'm still pretty shocked at the fact that they could be in a winning record situation yeah. there. I think, uh, I think you and I can come both can come to an agreement that they will go four and three. I mean, my prediction, I think they would go four and three, but if they don't have a seventh game like that, if they just go six, I would agree with three and three. Here's a little bit of a crazy prediction for myself for USC. Okay. Oh, no. I think USC will beat out Utah this year. I think they'll be at the top of the Pac-12 South. They blew a couple of dummy games last year. I mean, some huge question marks. I know BYU was – it's not a conference game, but that was still a game that was – like, how did you blow that one? And yeah. You're talking about for USC? For USC last season, it's just right, how yeah. did you blow that game? And I, I really think the, the, the Trojans have a good quarterback in Keaton Slovis. I really have a oh, lot yeah. of trust. I have a lot of faith in the youngster. I mean, to be freshman of the year last year mm -hmm. and to go over 3,000 yards in the passing, passing yards, I believe he had over 1,500 rushing mm -hmm. yards himself. So – I don't. No, no. I can't remember how many touchdowns he had. Passing touchdowns. He, you had an impressive showing last season, that's for sure. But so, I would agree. I would agree with you on the, on them. I think they can beat you. I think they'll beat Utah out this year. Maybe. I don't know. So here's my that's thing with USC. One. I'm I'm sorry to cut you off, but it kind of goes to what you're saying though. So around the start of the season, the last two years, when I don't again, I don't cover USC as closely as I do USC or UCLA. But the last two years, especially when they've kind of started the season ranked or been in, in and out of that top 25, they they lose a game early. I believe they lost uh, they might have lost the season opener two years in a row. I don't know. Well, they played Alabama. They played. Them. They played against Fresno last year for their home opener or their. And they might have won. They might have won that game, but then it was like I think it. you said that BYU game or something. Like they lose to a team they shouldn't lose to. They do it every year. It seems. It seems like. It seems like they lose to a team they shouldn't lose. It's kind of like I was saying with UCLA. They lose to Arizona, but then they beat Arizona State. Like how do you lose Arizona but then beat Arizona State? So it's the same thing. I get like I. I wouldn't be shocked if, if Arizona State beat USC this weekend. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be How shocked. How about that? That could be their one game that they lose and they That'd go be. on a streak to to win. So, but so do do you think you you made you kind of made a general prediction about them beating Utah? I mean, you could pull up the UCLA schedule and we can go over it right now. USC schedule, but I mean. You know, they're – I think they might be the only Pac-12 team ranked. Maybe – I don't know if Utah's in it. No, Oregon is ranked too, I would believe. Um, Oregon might be ranked ahead of USC. Is Stanford ranked this year? No, there's – I think they're going to be bad. They're, I think they're bad this year. Okay. Um, Stanford's not Stanford. Stanford is not Stanford this year. Um, that's for sure. Um, but they – they won't finish undefeated. I know that. USC is not going to go undefeated. No, not that. Um, I they, can't even predict that. So one of the things that they do have going for them, again, is, is with this one crossover game where they play a team from the north, uh, UCLA got Oregon. I'm trying to remember. I think USC gets like Washington State or something, which is they have a new coach. They don't have Mike Leach. If it was Mike Leach, anything can happen. I don't, you know. Um, so they, they luck out USC lucks out by not playing Oregon as a crossover team 
So they'll make, I think they'll make the Pac-12 championship game, but I think they still lose to Utah. I'm, I'll say if they're, they're either going to lose Arizona State in this first game or they're going to maybe lose to Utah. Utah is a team last year when – so UCLA got on, their, got on this little three-game streak. They were feeling good about themselves, feeling some type of way. And then they played Utah, and they were saying all week – they were, like, kind of talking about the defense, like, oh, yeah, like, like you know. And I don't, bl- I don't blame UCLA, but they were confident. And so they were using this confidence a little. It was showing a little too much against Utah. Word got back on what UCLA was saying to Utah, and the defense took it personal, and it was not a pretty game for UCLA. Um, so I'm expect, you know, um, people can prove and say things about Utah, but you can't count Utah out. I have you. I have Utah maybe beating US, USC this year, just just for that reason alone. Um, but to that point, they do. Uh, Utah does lose a defensive back um, or a few defensive backs. I think they lost like two guys. Two. I think they lose like two or three guys at defensive back. They do lose a linebacker, um, and they lose their quarterback and their running back. Both guys who are on NFL rosters. Um, so they have holes to fill too, and some guys that are going to be playing that didn't play in some roles last year, uh, or in a starting role last year. It just depends. It just I just, I feel. I mean, I don't know too much about USC's defense. I don't know. There's, there's, there's questions for me with the USC defense. The offense, solid, no problems. It's just can the defense, you know, is the what is the what is the USC defense going to do against or against Utah's offense? Um, you know, what are they going to do? You know what? The first test we'll st- we'll stick with this week in the season opener against Arizona State. I mentioned Jaden Daniels, much like Dorian Thompson Robinson, a dual threat quarterback, and will provide some challenges for that USC defense. You can have me on again next week and I'll give you, I'll give you my prediction on that USC Utah <laughs> game based on how this um, Jaden Daniels, Arizona state game goes against the USC defense. Um, but again, I think USC is going to be in it. They're going to, they're going to have, they're going to score points. Like there's no doubt about that. I went to the USC UCLA game last year. And I saw Keaton Slow as like Tara UCLA. I mean, that's not saying I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say like UCLA was this elite defense, but Keaton Slow has looked like a pro. So he's someone we can see in the NFL one day. And I do think, you know, with another year of experience, or with a year of experience, more like he didn't start the whole season. He wasn't expected to start. Um. You know, he has a full camp as a starter under his belt. He's going to go into the season opener knowing he's a starter. He's going to be confident. He's going to have experience. I think he's only going to get better. So, he's, watch out, Pac-12 South. I think he's definitely going to tear up the league. And I think that one game will be the loss against Utah. But you know what, James? We're going to have to wait and see what happens this week. Make sure to catch week one. UCLA will be playing against Colorado. And, of course, USC will be playing against Arizona State. So that's all the time we have left for this week's episode of Sideline Sports Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please give the video a thumbs up. Also, hit the subscribe button down below. This is why we're able to bring guests like James onto the podcast itself. And, of course, we got to thank the man himself for bringing all of his insight into it. So, you know what? Thank you so much, James. As you you guys, I recommend it. Please give this guy a follow. I will put all of his social media down in the description below. He's got so much great sports insight. And it's crazy. He's covering all of your favorite SoCal sports. So, if you guys don't want to follow me, consider follow James because he's official. He's legit on social media. (laughs) But without further ado, thank you so much, James, for coming on again. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and keep grinding, man. I, I appreciate all, and enjoy seeing all that you're doing and uh, just, just watching your journey. It's, it's inspiring, so keep at it. Thank you, James. Really appreciate that. And, of course, if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. The host of Sideline Sports Podcast, Alex Naveja, signing off for tonight. Enjoy week one of college football here in SoCal. Have a good night, everybody. Ah. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.